Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Jake's Take with Jacob Aishar podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Aishar, I'm the chief content producer and writer of jakestake.com, a pop culture entertainment news website. Now, before we get started with our today's conversation, if you're watching this video, please give us a subscription and a thumbs up. And also, if you're listening to this on our, any of our audio platforms, please give it a five-star rating and please subscribe to the podcast. I am thrilled to welcome our, if you're a music lover, you will love this episode. I am thrilled to welcome music producer who has worked with ASAP Rocky, Gucci Mane, Little Dirk, Nicki Minaj, and Rich the Kid. He's also the founder of the Five Points Bakery Production Company, and he has created the course of music monetization 499 at University of Illinois School of Music. So please help me welcome DJ Burn One. Hey, thank you so much, man. Much appreciated. Thank you for having me. DJ Burn One, it's a privilege to talk to be speaking with you. And thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to talk with us today. I really appreciate it. Definitely. Much love, man. All right. So when did you get interested in music? And how did that passion evolve the desire to pursue a career in the recording industry? I think uh, my passion started really early. I found the Kilo Ali tape when I was like maybe six or seven. And now I'm called Get This Party Started. And just hearing, he had like a mix of conscious rap. Stuff talking about racism, he had stuff talking about the strip club. It was like an explosion of ideas in my brain of just like, I didn't even know all these things were a reality. And so hip hop to me has always been like a way to get information, you know, it's kind of like a way to pass down information. And so from that point on, I literally just became obsessed with music. And so I got a computer really early. I got into music, like chat rooms early, like AOL chat rooms. People like the earliest forms of people downloading music and sharing music illegally online. You know, before it was legal, there wasn't Apple at first. There wasn't streaming. There was, hey, how do we get this music around online? And so people would go on chat rooms and stuff. And so anyways, I figured out that. Started burning some CDs, like kind of doing like, I would take the top eight songs on the radio, make my own version, and then sell them. And so I started doing that. Then I got a job in a mom and pop CD store. And from that point on, I started doing my own mixtape. And so... I started finding artists, finding exclusives uh, from independent artists in my area. And then I'll put like maybe 15 to 18 different songs together and release these compilations essentially. And just go around every day after school. I was in high school, like 11th grade when I started. And I'll just go around every day after school and just drop CDs off, talk to the CD store owner. CD store owner, get some like information or game, you know, whether it be just write about writing on my CDs or very simple things like that to deeper things about philosophy or whatever. Uh, and then, I, I I I really came across Gucci Man, like just stumbled across him, and that was kind of like my big break as far as mixtapes, because I talked him into doing mixtapes and did his first big mixtape, and kind of really, as he says in his autobiography, I gave him the blueprint on how to do mixtapes and executive produce the first one. We did Chicken Talk, and it did great. And so from that point on, I was able to tour DJ for Bubba Sparks, which led to me A and R for his label New South, which was really dope. So I picked beats for him and different things like that. That was really cool. And then past that, I started doing marketing. I did marketing for Rowdy Records at a group called The Backwoods of Dallas Austin. You know, got to actually work with him a little bit. You know, not like super close, but I got to just be around dark. That's where I bumped into like George Clinton. I like opened the door for George Clinton one time. And it was like, <laughs> I, I didn't even know it was him. I just heard some grumbling. It was like, Whoa. and I was like, who is that? And I looked and I just saw like this mass of hair and everything. And I looked and I was like, is that George Clinton? And I opened the door and it was him. He was like, Thanks. it just like walked in. I was like, this is the greatest moment of my life, you know? So just being able to be around there, I got to hang around like Lloyd and a bunch of them and hear the music they were making. It was really dope. And uh, just more more recently, you know, started producing and doing mixing and mastering. This is like more recently, this is like past 10, 10, 15 years. My career is pretty long. I'm like 36 now. And I started when I was like maybe 13, 14, releasing an official product. And so I've been releasing stuff for about 20 years now. Um, so like I said, it's cool to be in this educator phase now because it's like I always do something new. I've directed videos, I've done a bunch of stuff. And so this is like my ability sound design. We did sound design for the nineteen seventeen and Justice League movie trailers. And so being able to put all this together and say, kids, there's so many ways for you to monetize this. I I've been using an example of there's a kid uh, that played jazz piano there. And he was playing and I was like, Man, do you know how many ways you can make money off of you playing piano? And he was like, No. I was like you can play at a jazz club. You can uh, give piano lessons. You can make sample packs. You can play on people's records for money. You can perform live. I, I started running it down. You can make videos online. You can make tutorials. I was running down the, the list of ways he can make money. And he was just like, wow, I wish you could talk to my parents. 
you know, but the whole thing is we're trying to help it to where these universities, this is the whole understanding is that the way that things have been aren't, aren't serving these kids now, you know, like even at the university, they're really preparing them for the most part to go and perform at the Philharmonic or something like that. And they're, the success rate is really, really low, like staggeringly low of people that actually get to go and perform in this. And so my thing is, what if that kid doesn't even want to do that? Or what if he does want to do that and doesn't get picked? Does he quit and all the time he just spent on the last four years for nothing? Or do we say, hey, kid, you may have to do something else on the way to doing what you want to do. And so here's some other ways to monetize your art. Here's how to get better at your art. And here's how to monetize it and promote yourself in the meantime. And that way you can be working for yourself the whole time because, you know, it's good to work under other people. But we're teaching people in this course how to be self-empowered, how to make decisions for yourself, how to inform yourself of the basics. And some of the fundamentals that are not the basics, like the soft skills of how to deal with people, relationships, what to say, what not to say, when not to ask for things, when to actually ask for something, how to bring stuff to the table before you ask for stuff. You know, like there's very simple things that I feel like to me are so basic. And every day my emails are, you know, DMs are bombarded with people who don't follow simple laws of life, I guess you could say, you know, kind of like golden rule type vibes of things that just are just how people work, period. You know, it's like if you come to somebody with your hand out and you haven't done anything, why would they help? You? Everybody's probably coming to that person for help. But if you look and see, maybe, you know, just look at their page and maybe in the past week they say, hey, I need a videographer. Go rent a camera and pop up and just film. Like, you don't have to be the greatest one. You know, you don't. Like, I, that's what I was telling the kids up there. They had some famous rapper that was coming to the tour the next week. I was like, uh, y'all need to get in with that kid. Oh, the teacher, Professor Holden, he was like, y'all need to get in with them. And I was like, and I'll tell you the way, they're going to need a photographer or a videographer. One of y'all just hit them up and say, hey, I want to come in and film behind the scenes of the concert. And then when you're taking pictures and chilling, you don't have to say it right then. Maybe it's a completely different time. Oh, yeah, I have beats too. But provide value first and do a good job. And then people will want you around. And it's a very simple thing. Like my career, I've definitely had some ups and downs, but it's never been pressured. You know, it's been a very natural thing because I've always worked my way in rooms. And even though if I don't feel like I belong to be there, I'm bringing value for me to, enough to be in there. You know, I'm not just in there sucking up air and trying to take. People are always want me there because I'm always doing something. I'm bringing something. I'm hooking somebody up with something. I'm calling some type of alley-oop, you know. I'm like, here, you can do this with this person. Here, connect with this artist. Or, yeah, you can release your music like this or whatever. So people want me around. And I think people underestimate that. You know, they're like, oh, it's so hard. I don't really know about people. And it's like. Well, if you kind of judge people and say, I don't like people or people are stupid, you know, a lot of people have like preconceived notions about people on the whole, right? Like, oh, people in rap are like this or people on this music are like that. And it's like, if you can keep an open mind and just go into every situation, I treat the, I promise you, I treat the, the top person at the company the same way I treat the janitor. That's just how I was raised. That's just how I was raised. And so I think if, if more people can kind of take that into mind of being like, I need to be a good person first and foremost and do good business. Because other, other people, what it is, is people watch other people do bad business. And they say, I need to do bad business because somebody did bad business to me. And I'm, I'm here to say you don't have to be a shark. You don't have to take people. You don't have to lie. You don't have to cheat. You don't have to steal for this. You can just work hard and not even be competitive with anybody except for yourself. Like, to I, me, the most healthy competition you can have is with your, your yesterday or last week version of yourself. Like, I'm constantly being like, man, I'm so much better than I was last week better than I was last year, better, you know, even if I'm not sitting here appreciating my accomplishments, because I never do, I'm always thinking, and I'm still frustrated because I want to be even more better, right, but I'm, I'm competing with myself, and I kind of always, I always say this early too, like, I never looked at just specifically those who are in my proximity as my peers, I always looked at people I looked up to and said those are my peers, like Organized Noise and DJ Tumpa and all this, people that I loved and inspired and whose music raised me and now i'm around these people and i am their peer you know and i am like they're definitely not on the same level but i can just hang in a room with them we can jam we can create they love our sound and it's like it's a beautiful thing to have those types of relationships and i just want to tell people if you come into things with the right attitude the right mindset and if you come into a room and light it up people will want you there. they'll want you there if you work hard and if they say hey can you plug this up you just go and do it or if they say hey can you go and get lunch and you bring it back and everything's in the bag you know, like simple things to the way they're like, they did a good job with this. Maybe they'll do good with this. Like right now, this guy right here, David Banner, A Banner Vision. I engineered for David Banner. Uh, he's a famous rapper, active, actor, and activist. And um, like 
I literally, he was hosting my mixtapes when I was 18 years old, right? So he would just like talk on my tapes. He would send me freestyles. I'll go to the studio. He'd rap on just other people's beats and do freestyles for my tapes. And then maybe three, four years ago, we reconnected really, really well. And he hired me as his engineer, his personal engineer. So since then, I've been mixing his beats and really just like hand to hand working with him as his, his engineer. And now we have his new album, God Box 2, about to come out. And I've actually mixed some records on there which I never thought I'd be able to reach his bar. His bar is so, his ear is so attuned and so great. So the fact that I've actually been able to reach that bar on a couple of these records, I'm like, I'm so humbled and just grateful. But it was just because I just kept putting in the work. I never asked for it either. I didn't have to ask for it. You know, the work by itself spoke the volumes. And so that's what I want to tell people. If you just put the work in, do the work and build relationships and be healthy, be healthy, you know? Constantly asking people for stuff is not healthy. Being needy is not healthy. You know, bringing value to situations is a very healthy thing. And so that's what we're trying to teach you. And that's incredible because the thing is, I'm just so in awe of you. 20 years of music and going strong. I started my Jake's Take, my my blog, back almost 11 years ago. 11 years um, ago. And congrats. It's amazing. Thank you. And it's amazing how my podcast, and now I started the podcast back in, 20 in October 2019 and now we're up to this is episode 166 so wow. this is and it's amazing we've had some incredible lineups and like I would love to learn about some some of the stuff like going back to you I would love to learn about what about the five points bakery and its origin story if you have the so what could you describe that to my audience so the Five Points Bakery, basically the concept was something I came up with before and I did it under another name called Mick Vegas. And so if you look at Renaissance Gangster or anything like that, uh, Starlito says, RFP Mick Vegas, welcome back, burn one. So I originally had an idea to do a production team and have live musicians and kind of essentially what I have now, I thought that was going to be it. And I made beats and did a bunch of stuff. I did stuff for ASAP Rocky and a bunch of things. And uh, it wasn't with anybody else. It ended up basically me producing under pseudonym. I was trying to speak it into existence and it didn't happen. So after a year, I'm like, I'm just making beats under a pseudonym. And so I was like, I'm just going to go back to burn one. Um, and so anyway, so I linked up with uh, Go Where You Go and Walt Live. And we just got in and we would jam. Uh, go Where You Go plays guitar and other instruments. And Walt Live plays piano and a whole bunch of other instruments. They sing and they're artists as well. And so we got together and we would just jam for maybe 15 hours a day, like five days a week. And this wow. is like still while I'm working a part-time job. My, my ex-wife at the time was having a health ailment. So I was working like a part-time job to have benefits for her too. And like, no excuses, just literally knowing I had to figure it out. Because what I thought was, if I get a loud guitar on my beat, that just by itself, it'll be great. But then you realize the guitar don't edit itself. You know, it doesn't mix itself. It doesn't arrange itself. It doesn't, you know, there's so many factors behind it that go behind it, just the tones and the textures behind it. And so even with all of us being dope, figuring out how everybody fits together. And honestly, we were throwing so much at the track. We kind of became masters at this Bob Ross style of production of like how he paints and then scrapes away. He'll like paint some green and scrape away and paint some white and scrape away. And then he'll paint some brown and scrape away. And then you zoom out and it's like a tree. You're like, oh, this is dope. But it was like the adding and subtracting, adding a little bit of subtracting, adding a little bit of subtracting. And it's kind of like just adding these parts and figuring out what's necessary. So that's really what we honed over those years to where now when I hear arrangements, that's something we're really hard on kids about too. Not hard, but like really trying to impress upon them is that if you make these arrangements exciting and make great songs, that is going to do all the promotion and work for you. You know, that's going to do more of the work for you than you trying to fit in and then do a lot of great promotion. You know, it's like spending all this money. It's like spend the time making the great music and you're still going to have to promote it. But great music is the best promotion. And so that's that's one of the things we're trying to preach. But so the Five Points Bakery, the concept, to me, Five Points came from every time I would tour, I would go to a different city and they always had this area called Five Points. And it would be like a uh, hip, trendy, but not like in a way of like, these are the cool people because everybody says they're cool. It's just everybody is who they are and they're accepted for who they are. And I thought that was really cool. You know, you see people from all different walks of life, different hair, different everything. And everybody's just cool and getting along. Like ours, we have a little area called Little Five Points. You know, and so it's like Five Points Bakery. We make music, uh, you know, uh, like Ricky and I say, it's uh, baked fresh from scratch, no GMOs. Um, you know, because the, uh, like these kids aren't understanding. Like I showed them how we made samples up there and they were just mind blown 
and how we're essentially not doing this A to B process. A lot of people will play a riff and go, and then now they got doom, doom, doom going, and now they'll add drums and whatever. We don't have a very linear process like that. Sometimes we'll jam for like an hour or two sometimes, and then just take 10 seconds of that, slice it into a chop, and then build a whole new beat around that, not use anything else from that 15 minutes. You know, it's like we just made the the dough, like the, the dough from scratch instead of going to the store and buying the bread. You know, like we just made the dough to make it. So it's like I was showing the process and they're like, what's next? I'm like, okay, now's the beat. They're like, all that to get to the beat? I'm like, yeah, we just made the sound. Because to me, my biggest thing was trying to do McVegas or the production crew five points. Like, I wanted to figure out after that first year, I started making beats because I was someone making five beats a day for a year. I did that at the end of it. I was like, sampling is kind of easy, you know? Like kind of because you're using all these you're using like hundreds of years worth of musicianship between all the players on one record. It's gonna be all right, whatever you do with it, you know. And so I was like, I want to make music sound like samples, and so I went deep on understanding textures, sonic sound, m melodies, music theory, all this stuff. Bro, it's like it goes so deep, and so I just became like obsessed with research. And so I'll spend hours every day, even until now, of just reading interviews and watching mix with the masters and. Just doing all this consuming to where I have these tools in my tool belt for when I need them. And so when I'm in a situation, I'm like, ah, oh, recorded. And it wasn't to the tempo in Pro Tools. But because I, I've watched this video on some random time, I promise you, bro, I can pull something out of my hat and on the fly, fly it back in because I knew something just in that moment. And it's like, I've always wanted to be prepared. Like the worst thing you can do is ask for an opportunity and not be prepared to smash it. That's the worst thing. And so I've always wanted to say, I don't want to be in the room until I'm ready. When I'm ready, I just want to smash it. And so that's what we're trying to just teach these kids. Like, if you smash it, people will want you around, and you're going to probably be all right. Awesome. And I always try to make sure to smash stuff and be prepared with every, every interview that I go into. So i got to say, is this the same process that you use every time when, like, someone like ASAP Rocky comes in or David Banner comes in or if Gucci comes in or if Nikki comes in? Do you go through the same process with all of them or, is there, or are there different processes for different artists? There's different processes every time. So like some of the placements, like the Nicki Minaj and Lil Durk, uh, the Jadena, we did a record called Tribe. It was uh, Jadena's last single. Um, some of those records are samples that we created. And so 10 years ago, one of the things we started doing was creating just the music and sending it to producers for them to sample. And so we did Young Ma's Walk like that with our homies One Mind. We did a bunch of records off of that. So that's one way. Is literally, if we can't get in the studio with producers, we'll make a bunch of music and then email it to them. They'll make the beat, get it placed. And so that's how the Nicki Minaj came about. That's how a lot of those records came about. Um, somebody like David Banner, I gave him a sample too. I gave him and his producers some samples. And so I think we have co-production on a, a really dope record on there. Um, and it's because of a sample again. But a lot of times, also like the Superfly song, the Superfly record that we did for Sleepy Brown and Scars, the first song on the Superfly reboot soundtrack that came out three or four years ago. Uh, Future was the executive producer of it. And uh, we did it, yeah, we did it with Sleepy Brown and Scar, and we did that from scratch, like from scratch. Like I remember starting with just a hi-hat loop, and then uh, I think Walt played that initial piano, and I went do, 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 on the bass. And I was like, okay, this sounds like it's got a nice black exploitation vibe. It's feeling like Curtis. And then we kept building, and then we got with Sleepy Brown, who's like, put some drums on, I'll write to it. And so it was like one thing led to another, and then we went to Stankonia and added all these parts. I helped arrange the backgrounds and showed Preston Crump, out, uh, the bass player who played on a lot of the Outcasts and Dungeon Plan records, who's one of my uh, best friends now. Uh, I got to show him the bass line, you know, that I wrote, and I was like so nervous, like, you know, just, just uh, but I was, I was just so happy in that moment. Um, but it, all these records come about differently, so that one was completely from scratch. And, that was like three months of adding and subtracting, adding and carving, addition and subtraction. So to so where some of these other records, we send the sample off and the producer does the rest of the work. Um, a lot of times the producers really just, you know, put drums and put a couple of effects and the music's already there. I mean, it's like if you listen to like rolling up down there for you for Rocky, it's just a straight loop of a sample. And I put a sub and added like a sense for the hook, but it wasn't like it was rocket science. You know, sometimes it's like if the vibe is good, you don't have to do too much. Awesome. And then I got to say, three months is a long time for a song. And like, I'm 
to create a song because there's been interviews where he said 30 minutes, an hour. I'm like, wow, but like three months is a very long, if you really want to produce a well-produced song. Yeah, well, we had on that one specifically, it was, a, a, it was our Curtis Mayfield tribute. So it had like a special significance to me. And then we had so many different elements. We had live strings, we had harps, we had flute players, we had horns, we had a bunch of different horns. Siraj played all those, but he had played, he had played like, I forget how many different horns he played on there. Um, we had three different background singers. We had the two features. We had three different bass players, including me and Walt and Preston. So it was like three of us. And then uh, Chance Parkman, who played keys on Sorry Miss Jackson, played piano on there. Um, it was a, it was, it was a, a, a big production. And so it's kind of like one of those things of where if you're adding so much, not all of it can stay. You know, it's, it's going to step on each other. It's going to be like, you know, to me, I always want to keep keep my head nodding, and, and I never want to be broken out of the zone. You know, so it's like until nothing breaks me out of my zone, I have to keep working. And so something could break me out of my zone if the song is calling for something, or if it's saying something needs to be taken out. So a lot of times I listen to a song. I had a guy who was working on the house. He was like, "What are you doing when you're listening to the song? Repeat?" Because he's outside working on the house. I'm just stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. I was like, uh, "I'm fixing it." You know, I'm fixing it. Like I'm going down and I'm just carving. And I'm like, what part needs more energy? What part needs less energy? What part needs the lift? What part needs to be the the, uh, the drop? And so it's just making all these decisions. That's incredible. And speaking of dis making decisions, you helped break Freddie Gibbs, Pill, Yellow Wolf into the recording industry. So what qualities do you look for in recording artists if you want to advance into a, a bigger audience? I'm always looking for artists that inspire me and that entertain me first off, because we're in the entertainment business. So Gucci made me laugh. He was rapping about street stuff, but it was so funny. And so I was like, man, this dude is hilarious. I almost like, he's rapping about street stuff, but it was funny. So it was like Joe Pesci and Goodfellas to me. You know, like funny how, funny like a clown. It's like, it's tense, but it'll make you laugh at the same time. And so people like Young Joe, I just thought was so funny too. He was so lyrical and funny. He was like a cartoon character. Um, and so a lot of times it's just me finding people, me being like, I like that. Other people may like that. It really doesn't go a lot deeper than that. I try not to be like, what are the people going to want? Or, you know, I feel like people get into this mindset of like the algorithm and this is working right now. This artist is hot. And then you just realize like you're just following and you're chasing and none of that matters. It's like making art that's true to you and something that the universe needs. Like to me, I make music for healing. I've had a soldier tell me that uh, Renaissance Gangster got him through a second tour in Iraq. Like, I can't even comprehend what that means because I've never been at war, you know? But it's like for somebody to take solace in our music, it's like, this is for healing. I have chefs that say they cook to it. You know, I know people like will fall asleep to it or, or, you know, study and, you know, write their stuff to it if it's instrumentals. And it's like, it's music to live your life to. It's, it's a healing thing. We did a whole yoga album just on a very spiritual healing you know, kind of, kind of thing. And so um, I'm not even sure where that, where that question was going. I kind of fell off on a tangent. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Don't worry. It's basically um, what to remind you of that question is you helped, you broke Freddie Gibbs, Pill, Yellow Wolf into the recording industry. Right. So what qualities and additional qualities you look for in recording artists to say, hey, I want to give them a platform or, or a much bigger platform. Does it excite me? That's it. That's it. Does it make me feel like this? And if I feel up and I'm like, hey, other people might have the same reaction. Because I know this is not like a rocket science thing. It's just an emotional thing. And if it's pulling something out of me and making me lean in, it's probably going to do it to other people, too. And then a lot of times it doesn't work out. You know, we're talking about my successes. I've worked with so many artists who have not made it. And a lot of times they don't invest in themselves. You know, and so it's tough uh, when you feel like somebody really has talent, and really, uh, really can do it. And then they don't put the time into themselves to get prepared for the occasion or they don't put the footwork in to start to build up their own reputation or they think that I'm going to do everything for them. I'm like the most successful people I've worked with, Gucci Man and Pierre Bourne, they were on their own accord the whole time. Like I just poured fire on what they were doing. It wasn't like it was a zero to 100 situation and there was nothing going on. I came in and then they're superstars. People have this thought of like uh, people put people on. And that's not really a thing. Nobody can put you on. You have to put yourself on through consistent effort, consistent work. This is the only way to do it.
Absolutely. I 100% agree with you because I've been building up my interviews. This has been a huge year for me because I had one of my biggest, one of the biggest inter celebrities I had was Howie Mandel on this podcast. So it was great awesome. to have it. That's awesome. Yeah, it was. It was fabulous. So I had a great time with him. But enough about Howie. We got to get back to you, DJ Burn One. I, I loved hearing about the musical monetization class. So how did this partnership with the University of Illinois School of Music came about? So I released the pre-order link for my production masterclass option, where I'm basically teaching people how to make dope music, same concept, how to make dope music, how to monetize your art, and how to network and basically promote yourself and how to handle business. So I announced it online in the fall and Professor Holden found out about it. He had interviewed me on the Producer Ground podcast like four years ago. And he was like, hey, we got 700 kids at the school that play instruments and they all want to be in the music industry. I think they'd be interested. And so he pitched it to the school and they created a whole new class called Music Monetization 499. And it's asynchronous. We're in week uh, 13 now, I think, which is pretty cool, um, which is pretty wild to say we have a real class at an at a official tier one college. So. That's uh, it's really amazing to even just have that opportunity. Like I'm, I'm humbled and grateful even just that with how much I want to accomplish. Just that alone is like, come on. Like I never like it was really cool being able to sit with the dean and to sit with the the director of the school and tell them how I wasn't allowed into the music program at my college that I already had an A average at the first year because I didn't play an instrument. And and it's crazy because that's everybody's story. I've heard so many people say I didn't go to college for music too because of that same thing. I switched my major. I wish I would have done this or whatever. It's like people get thwarted from their path because these gatekeepers told you you couldn't do this or you weren't. And I told the dean, I, that's what I told him. I was like, I was more popular than everybody at my school. I was already releasing successful mixtapes. I'd already dropped Gucci's Chicken Talk, you know? So for them to tell me I wasn't worthy of their program, you know, when really none of them were even on my level when I was like 18, 19. I was already smashing it, you know. They should have been asking me for the fight. That's what I was telling the dean. He was like, "You're right," you know. Um, but it's it's just one of those things where I want kids to have the opportunity and not have their dreams thwarted. Because what I'm realizing too, talking to the kids, a lot of kids don't follow because their parents can't see them having a sustainable future in it because it hasn't been proven of how to monetize your music in different ways. It seems as if you're telling your parents you want to win the lottery when you say you want to join the music industry instead of saying, "No, mom." I'm actually going to start selling samples this week. I'm going to start doing this. Like, that's what I keep telling these kids. I'm like, if you do something to bring some money in now, they'll see it's actually making you money. And other kids who the other kids aren't going to, aren't doing this and aren't going to our class, they're not making money because you're already putting this stuff in action. Like I was telling the dean, I was like, three weeks ago, we had sync week in our class. If these kids are paying attention and care, they can get some sync placements before the end of the school year. Like that's never happened before in any type of schooling system saying you can be successful right now we're not selling you specifically on way years down the line pay attention now and you can have success before you even finish like that to me is groundbreaking and so we're working on a host of things i can't really talk about right now but a host of things to really help education in a way that not saying only we can but specifically i know i can in a very special way i gotta say this is going to change so many people's lives and so many students' lives. I wish that this class was in it for like for monetization for journalism when I was in college and, and also for other schools. Have you thought about franchising it at all or you or is like we have to check back later? No, I mean, that's my plan. I mean, we've already talked with a couple other schools about getting picked up in the fall. Um, so it's looking like it's already about to spread out. Um, my idea is to, to really revolutionize music education. And honestly, have that spread to other areas. Like you said, why not have a class on monetization? I feel like colleges are going to have to start teaching kids there's eight different ways to make money off the thing you want to do and telling you how to actually do it as opposed to just saying, this is what writing is. Go figure it out. Right? Like, there has to be a way of a funnel to get these kids somewhere. So I'm trying to build a pipeline to the, the studios in the area, to the studios in Atlanta with Tree Sound Studios and Paul Diaz. He came up there with me and that was amazing. And so we have this unique opportunity to really have an impact and have people teach these kids that they respect. You know, you're learning from, we're doing a bass course with Preston Crump. You get to learn bass from Preston Crump. You know, he played the basses on, on Outcast records and stuff like that, you know? Just, just the vibe of feeling like 
I'm learning from somebody whose music I care about and who's done the thing. You know, I think a lot of people just on a whole, uh, either that sometimes teachers are knowing or they're not accomplished and they can't give. How can how could somebody who has not made it in music tell a kid how to make it in music? If you've never got placements, how can you tell a kid? If you've never got if, if you haven't broken an artist, how can you tell a kid? If you haven't done these things, how can you tell them? And so it's like, yeah, if you, you know, right now in most colleges, if you played in the Philharmonic, you can come back and teach. You know, but what I'm finding in, in just music period is the people who really made it have so much money, they'll donate to charity, but they're not giving time back, mostly past that, right? And then the people who are legends who didn't get taken care of are so salty, they're not trying to give back either. So who's passing down this knowledge to the kids? Who's telling these kids, this is what I fell for, you don't fall for it. This is what they're going to try to sell you on, don't buy it. Who's going to tell these kids that? It's us. It's us. And I want to spark other people who are, are kind of in my, my area, you know, my peers, to be like, yo, we got to help these kids. We got to help these kids because I feel like a lot of people's help is coming from them trying to sell something. And yeah, I am selling the master class. But thinking about you get 20 years of experience and 15 videos, and and literally, I'm shortcutting so many problems you could have, you know. That's like the best right now. Right now, you can get on the pre-order for like two fifty, you know. It's like that is a steal. That is a steal for the amount of information that's in there. I wish I was able to have just bypass all the pain that I had to get go through to learn those lessons and just pay that two fifty, you know. Um, but and, and that's another thing I learned too. If people don't pay for something, they won't appreciate it, right? So if I'm just giving it away free, they may think, oh, whatever. But if they put their $250 of hard work money, hard earned money on the line, they're going to listen and they're going to pay attention. And then they may follow through and do some of this stuff because that's what I want. I don't want money from the pre-orders or whatever. I want these kids to take what we're saying and use it and make better music, make better decisions, have better relationships. That's the goal. That's the goal. It's not anything else because the value that comes from that is a better world. It's a better world, right? Like better music, artists. Think about how many artists have been thwarted from making music because somebody screwed them over, some contract or this, that, or the other. We're telling you how to negotiate a contract. We're telling you what's in a contract and what you're supposed to do, how to know your rights, how to work with other people. If you're a musician or if you're a producer, we're telling you on all sides. Or if you're an artist, we're talking about splits and publishing and all this stuff. These are the things you need to know. But on top of that, just going to visit with the college, I got a really well-rounded perspective of exactly what, because a lot of these kids are super dope already, you know? So it's like things that I wasn't even thinking about, relationship with the parent and, you know, belief in self and believing that you can actually make money off of the thing that you haven't monetized yet. Because a lot of these kids have been playing keys, but making money from the keys has not been a thing they've done. Or they've been playing an instrument, but they've never made money from it. So it's kind of like opening their mind when I'm talking to them about NFTs. And I'm like, y'all should link up with somebody on the visual side and drop NFTs and do this, that, and the other. And they're like, what? Like, I can do this and own that? I'm like, yeah, you can do it right now. Like, tomorrow night, you can mint your own first NFT and be making money off of it, already be getting in the community and, and doing this. And so it's a whole new world of possibilities with technology, with the internet, with the age of information. And that's another thing, too. Like, we have a whole section on the masterclass in the masterclass about research and the main thing is discernment how to discern what is bs from what is uh, necessary what information do i need what do i not need i've kind of through how much research i've done i've kind of developed this method of only taking what i need out of things so i can watch a 10 15 minute video and if i only needed one minute that's all i take and i'm good you know it's like that's with me and i'm good and i can keep it moving so i'm trying to teach people because a lot of kids are like who do i listen to who do i trust like a lot of stuff i see people teaching online I'm like what are y'all talking about what are you telling these kids like this is all wrong and so i'm like i can't fix other people i can't fix influencer i can't do i can't fix all this stuff but i can just directly talk to these kids and just tell them what i feel like will help prepare them to really be successful and kind of kind of do what they want to do and make their dreams come true because it's wide open right now it's wide open and i keep telling people only you can stop you nobody can hold you back nobody can blackball you People are like, why do you talk so crazy or why do you talk so freely? And it's because nobody can stop me but me. I'm not going to say anything mean spirit. I'm not mean hearted. And I'm only ever trying to make anything better. So I'm not going to really get out of pocket like that. Nobody's perfect, but I'm coming from a good place. You know, and at the end of the day, people know 
I'm trying to make things better, you know? And so I think if, if you come with that energy, people are just a lot more receptive here. And you're going to make things a whole lot better, DJ Burn. When I got to tell you that much right now, based on this conversation and based on hopefully for everyone is listening to this, I hope that you they take you up on that $250 thing because this sounds like it's going to change so many people's lives, so many artists' lives, so many artists, so many recording artists. And I, and I pray that when it franchises it, it gives you them a lot more opportunities to expand because this, I'm just very grateful that you've talked about this. And I know we're running out of time, but I would like to talk to you about what two, I have two more final questions to send you. Are you ready? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we got to talk about social media and what do you, and how, and what are your, some of your favorite platforms? Uh, my favorite platforms um, for NFTs is Twitter. I love the NFT community on Twitter. I'll probably say out of everything, what Twitter has become with NFTs because it's so global and because of how how you interact on there, there's something about, it's very cool. When I first got into NFTs like a year, a little over a year ago, I got so engulfed in it, I really wasn't sleeping. And so I could stay on Twitter and just watch the different time zones wake up and interact with the people, you know, like as it's going and like watch it going between Asia and here. And, you know, it's kind of like I know, you know, like here at like uh, seven o'clock, you know, it's kind of like a couple hours past in Britain or whatever it is, you know what I'm saying? And like I'm already understanding. So I built these relationships just because I was up talking to these people. And that would have never been possible on Instagram or TikTok or anything else. But also. You gotta love how organic TikTok is, and it looks like there's some Instagram uh, organic growth coming back now since they're recommending follows and things like that. Um, but you know, we're also teaching people build direct to consumer marketing, build, build direct with people. That way, you can have a direct connection. And if for whatever reason your account gets banned or whatever happens, the website goes down. You didn't just lose your access to your fans. You still have that connection with them, and you can talk directly to them. So I think it's about utilizing social media in the best way, finding the best things about it, and then just being smart. Awesome. Now, the second last question. Where can my audience connect with you on social media? Number one. Number two, where do you can find information about music monetization? And number three, where can I listen to some of your greatest hits? Hey, awesome. So you can find the pre-order link, uh, www.b5pointsbakery.com, all spelled out, b5pointsbakery.com, so you can get the pre-order there. Uh, and the actual promo code for the $50 off is DGB50, so that's what makes it $250. Um, so use that. And then uh, you can find my music on Spotify. I got a, a production playlist up there and a mix playlist, um, Spotify and everything like that. I actually have, I think I have some links in my bio on Instagram. And so, like, if you look on there, you can find a lot of information because we shoot a show called Tree Church of Sound, too, that I host. That's really cool. And so I was telling you about our sample process. We actually do it live there every time. And then we film it. We'll create jams on all the vintage equipment. We'll have a special guest producer who's famous come, like DJ Monte or DJ Tom. Come, they'll flip the sample. We'll play a couple more sounds on top, and then we'll do a short interview. So you can go on there and see some of the Tree Church of Sound interviews uh, and episodes. Those are really dope. Um, Man, we we got a lot going on. We got a lot going on. Got like I said, David Banner's got a box two about to drop. Like our whole squad, Walt Ricky. Everybody's got a lot of music about to drop. We got some instrumental projects about to come out. And and really the education thing, like I said, is really just kind of blindsided me and it's just a world of possibilities. So I'm really ready to just kind of like uh, bear down on it and just see what impact we can really make on it and how much we can actually help these kids because going up there I'm like they need us and i know it's not just there i know it's just a symptom of 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 uh of what's going on at a larger scale with just universities and you know it's like honestly people's hearts are in the right place you know everybody does want to help it's just understanding the culture the community the kids the parents everybody's motivations and how they're all different parents just want their kids to have a successful life and make money for themselves right so they're going to stop them from doing something that seems stupid, like a wild goose chase, like music. But if the kid shows up and is making money off of it, saying, "Hey, I'm doing the thing," 
you can't tell me I'm making not making money because I'm making money already. You know, it's kind of like a show and prove thing. And so I realize even with what we're doing right now with this, it's like we're showing proof of concept every day with every class, every college that we're going to spread it through, every course. Um, because we have a lot of courses that are about to roll out. Like it's 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 about to be really fun. So I'm I'm excited. I'm so excited for you. And you guys, you gotta come back on the podcast to talk about that. And speaking right. of podcasts, if you miss an episode of the Jake State with Jake Valley Show podcast, visit our channels on Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Google Podcasts, Podcast Addicts, Spotify, and Spreaker. Jake's Take with Jacob LHR, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Now, are you on social media? Because I'm on social media too. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, all one, all Jacob LHR, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Now, DJ Burn, what I just told you in this interview, that jakes-take.com is celebrating 11 years this August. Congrats, congrats, man. That's so fire. Thank you so much. If you want to see more cool podcasts, more interviews, and more reviews, visit jakes-chick.com. And guys, if you're financially able to, please consider heading to PayPal because it can help you jakes-chick.com up and running. I am the guy. I'm a one-man band. I do everything. So if you're financially able to, awesome. I really appreciate your support. If you're unable to, I totally understand. And the strong alternative, guys, is to subscribe to the podcast and also follow me on social media. DJ Burn One, oh my God, this was incredible. Thank you so much. You got to come back. You are more than welcome to come back because I cannot wait to see how this goes. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And everybody can find me at DJ B U R N O N E on all social media, at DJ Burn One. So follow me and uh, keep up, man. We just made the head of the newspaper last week in Illinois. That was so far. Uh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm just so proud. <laughs> I'm so happy. And and I'm honored and humbled, and I'm just ready to really bring some value to these kids' lives. You know, help folks make better music and protect themselves. Awesome. DJ Berlin, thank you so much. And for everyone who's watching this interview, and thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great one, everybody. Until next time, have a great day. Bye.